uh, on radiation mode. So anyway, this is going to be a bit of a var variety show. There won't, there won't be any dancing, but we'll <laughs> see, see what we can do otherwise. Um, so as far as uh, future trends goes, I uh, was sitting here the other day making note. Uh, and so this is just sort of, I admit, a kind of first draft of things that uh, might be interesting in the future, uh, sort of organized in terms of, more or less arbitrarily, in terms of targets, uh, things that we might uh, design to. And then measurement procedures, predictive tools, noise control methods, and just uh, uh, communication, which is not really noise control, but is connected. Uh, so as far as targets goes, um, uh, you saw that there was the, when I was introducing the Herrick Labs, there's uh, this thing about perception-based engineering. And the whole point there is to get the human in the loop, as it were, in the design process. So that um, I think, as Professor Mahanti suggested this morning, uh, that you could design. One hopes finally design a machine or something <coughs> uh, in the in the computer, uh, create a model for it, run it, and ultimately hear what it sounds like. Right, so that uh, we're not left necessarily with uh, having to satisfy certain metric criteria, uh, just achieving numbers or whatever, uh, but actually trying to achieve a certain uh, perception of the device uh, based on actual uh, prototype or virtual prototyping, which is what this is. So that um, it would be really nice uh, to be able to do that, but we're not. Des despite some claims by commercial software people, we're not really at the point yet uh, where we can do uh, reliable prediction from the ground up. Uh, the most impressive uh, stuff that I've seen along these lines is um, uh, some work that Steve Rizzi at NASA is doing related to uh, simulating aircraft flyovers of various kinds. So. Uh, jets of various kinds, uh, propeller aircraft, uh, rotorcraft, and things like that. I, I was kind of initially skeptical about uh, all of the effort that was going into this, but it is a very powerful tool for letting people know what things are actually going to sound like uh, on the ground under realistic circumstances. So <coughs> they've put an enormous effort into that. and. Uh, and produced very impressive results, I think. Um, the other thing that uh, I think should happen in this area uh, is uh, more sophisticated sound quality models. So uh, we're doing a lot of, of course, there's a lot of work uh, going on on sound quality at the moment. Uh, and we all know about uh, sharpness, loudness, roughness, fluctuation strength, and things like that. And these are all based on studies of humans uh, under very sort of, I would say, neutral conditions, I think, right? Where the acoustic input is the major uh, thing that they're experiencing. Whereas, of course, in, in, in real life, uh, we're not normally sitting in nice, quiet, anechoic rooms with headphones on <laughs> making judgments about noises. Uh, so we're exposed to different thermal environments, uh, different uh, degrees of illumination, so on and so forth. So that uh, it would be nice, ultimately, to uh, have a, maybe a more complete uh, human model, as it were, uh, that uh, takes as its input not just uh, sound metrics, but uh, factors related to the environment that you're in at the time. Uh, so thermal illumination, whatever. And, uh, well, and particularly vibration, right? Because there's an interaction between vibration and noise. <coughs> and your reaction to noise may be quite different depending on what uh, environment you're in at the time. Uh, soundscapes, I don't know if you're very familiar with the notion of soundscapes, but this is uh, the audio equivalent of landscapes, 
right, so that it's meant to describe the sound associated with a particular environment, whether it's an urban setting or a country setting or out in the desert or whatever, a more or less realistic uh, recreation of uh, some acoustic environment. And from a design uh, point of view, uh, there's early work um, sort of foc focused on designing acoustic environments in urban spaces to create a certain impression right? uh, and to um, minimize tension, for example, increase relaxation, da -da 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 -da, so that uh, there can be intended outcomes, is what I'm saying here, uh, related to acoustic environments, right? So um, the title of this course has, you know, noise control in the title. And of course, we're all concerned about decreasing noise levels, but ultimately, of course, we can never drive anything to zero, right? Uh, and that isn't really the objective, I think. We might uh, find it a little bit disturbing, actually, if there were absolutely no sound at all, right? So it might be a little bit creepy or something. Uh, so I think a more, a slightly more sophisticated idea is that we want to achieve certain, um, certain targets uh, related to an acoustic environment. And I think a certain amount of uh, thought has to go into what we're trying to achieve uh, in certain settings, not just making everything quiet, but sort of shaping things uh, to achieve some certain effect. So anyway, that's soundscapes. Uh, measurement procedures. Um, so uh, something that we've done a lot of work with is acoustic holography, which um, uh, of various types where you make uh, measurements with an array of microphones or with a bunch of microphones and based on that information you can do projections of sound fields uh, towards sources or away from sources so you can you can just just like intensity scans you can produce really impressive three-dimensional color plots right uh, which uh, tell you uh, in significant detail where sources are, what, how strong they are, and things like that. So there's a uh, practical value to acoustic holography. Um, beta, uh, conventional, quote-unquote, holography is based on doing spatial Fourier transforms, transforms into the wave number domain, projections there, inverse transforms. Uh, and so there are uh, significant issues related to windowing of data uh, when you do those kind of things. So in recent years, there have been a number of developments uh, to address those kind of issues. SONAS, statistically optimized near-field acoustic holography, is uh, one of those uh, which we've used with um, considerable success. But the thing that's kind of hot uh, at the moment is uh, actually a much simpler approach uh, just using a so-called equivalent source method where you assume that the sound field that you're measuring has been made by a whole bunch of simple sources uh, hidden away behind the real source plane uh, and basically in essence really just doing a least squares fit uh, to work out what the strength of the minimum of the uh, equivalent sources is. So mathematically actually uh, pretty simple, uh, but there are uh, significant issues related to getting rid of sources that are not contributing and also some re regularization that's necessary to make it work. Um, so uh, what has to happen there uh, is that all of, all of the existing methods, and except some stuff that we're doing, is based on arrays of monopoles, which are very simple sources uh, and if you're going to create something that has a strong directivity, you have to have a bunch of monopoles that are nearly canceling each other. So that seems kind of inefficient to me. So the <coughs> I think uh, we need to use uh, higher order sources like multipoles and various kinds to do the equivalent source stuff. And we are 
working on that. The radiation mode stuff uh, is something I'm particularly keen on, uh, where you express the surface velocity of an object in terms of these things, these radiation modes, which are an orthogonal set of functions uh, defined over the surface of the radiating object. Um, and you can work out the sound power radiated by the source simply by multiplying the surface velocity in turn by each of the radiation modes and adding up the result. So uh, since the modes are independent with each other, uh, you know that if you reduce a velocity associated with one of the radiation modes, the sound power will absolutely go down, right? And so I think uh, this is a very interesting procedure because it gives you actual guidance as to what to do uh, if you want to reduce the sound power being radiated by a particular device. Whereas earlier procedures just show you where the source is, uh, the radiation mode stuff suggests what you need to do to reduce the sound power. And we are at the same time working with that kind of thing as a design <coughs> tool, uh, giving a paper on that at the upcoming Society of Automotive Engineers conference. Be there. Uh, uh, but uh, I think it's a way of bringing together the tools that you use in design, so finite elements and boundary elements, and the stuff that we do from an experimental side. So I would really like to try to bring the measurement and design worlds together around this uh, tool that can be shared by both. Anyway, so that's, that's not so much the future, that's me delivering <laughs> editorial comment. Uh, because as you may be, as those of you working out there in the real world will know that the measurement crowd and the analysis crowd often don't have much way <laughs> of communicating with each other. And it would be nice if there was some sort of common platform that they could share, I think. Uh, the other, my much longer term uh, wish is to uh, just get rid of microphones. Microphones are a nuisance, right? Uh, <laughs> from, from a number of points of view, they occupy space. Uh, they interfere with the sound field uh, and things. So, of course, for the moment, they're necessary, but I would like to get rid of them. Uh, I have no idea how <laughs> exactly at the moment. Uh, one of our former students works for a company in London that sells um, a fiber optic sensing system that is useful, uh, particularly underwater, uh, for doing remote sensing of pressures. As you can reel out this fiber optic line that's a kilometer long, and by shooting lasers along the, uh, the fiber optic, you can get uh, scattering back uh, that's related to the pressure exerted on the fiber optic cable by uh, the external pressure field at any point. So you can scan anywhere along the length of this cable with a resolution that's maybe a little like this or something. So underwater where the sound speed is pretty fast, that gives you a sort of interesting resolution <coughs> so it'd be nice uh, to be able to do uh, something similar in air. At the moment, the fiber optic stuff is not nearly sensitive enough to deal with uh, the kind of sound pressures that we uh, achieve in air, or that exist in air. Uh, but uh, I've seen some interesting work with lasers um, transmitting from a sender to receiver uh, where you get an integrated um, pressure along the length of the laser between the sender and the receiver. Uh, so that is sort of like a microphone of sorts, but uh, as I say, integrating along a line, it would be nice, of course, to be able to do a time-resolved version of that where you can work out the sound pressure at a point. Uh, so somewhere in the future, I think we will be <coughs> measuring sound pressures with lasers rather than with microphones. Um, 
and speaking of lasers at the moment, uh, a lot of us have uh, single point laser Doppler velocimeters, which um, for us actually has been the great tool for the last 20 years uh, from an experimental point of view, uh, being able to do uh, spatially extended vibration measurements kind of easily, uh, allowing us to do uh, uh, wave number transform stuff, uh, working at dispersion relations and structures, uh, really super uh, convenient, right? But uh, the next step, maybe instead of doing one point at a time or even under automated scanning, of course, it would be nice to be able to do the whole structure at once, right? Uh, <laughs> the sound effects are important here, right? Um, and in fact, there's some, uh, I've recently seen demos of uh, some very high-speed cameras, uh, in effect, with uh, associated illumination that uh, may allow us to do things like vibrations of whole tires and stuff at once. And I think uh, if, if that uh, gets going, that's uh, going to be a very powerful tool uh, for doing experimental work related to vibration. So I look forward uh, to that. Uh, the other <coughs> uh, <coughs> thing here, sorry, very large scale data acquisition, uh, hundreds or thousands of channels. Uh, we did an experiment back in the early 90s involving something like 500 channels of uh, microphones, which took like a year to set up or something. Uh, these days, it's pretty routine in the automotive business to uh, do something with, uh, let's say, 160 channels of data. Uh, I was visiting a friend in the Detroit area working now for the, the B&K Projects people, uh, and they had a Tesla Model S uh, in, the, in the lab, <laughs> and there were hundreds of wires coming out of this thing because they were doing uh, transfer path analysis on the thing to, uh, to uh, as they were saying, on behalf of a certain fruit company on the West Coast, which at that time was interested in cars, right? Maybe not so much at the moment, but a year and a half ago they were. Um, so, uh, and that trend is going to continue because data acquisition these days is kind of cheap uh, compared to <laughs> I hate to say it, the old days, right? Uh, but now uh, you can do so much with your phone, it's kind of scary, right? So uh, we're going to, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge from an organizational point of view to be able to deal with all of the data that you generate and analyze. Uh, the, other, the other thing that I would really, really like, uh, we, that we've just bought, uh, I forget, so they had 128 mics uh, to use in, a, in an array system. And the big hassle uh, is dealing with all the wires, right, <laughs> that uh, uh, come from these things. So if, if we could, uh, I'll, I'll stick with microphones if we could make them wireless, right, uh, so that you don't have to connect it to uh, something and have hundreds of cables. Uh, dragging all over the place. So if uh, we could do that, uh, that would be, so if you could make that happen, that would make me happy. Uh, the other, this is a little bit off to one side, but uh, of course the fact that everyone, you know, everyone in this room now has a, a smartphone uh, means that you have an audio recording device. Uh, and a, I think, I'm not, there may have been some attempts at this so far, but it would be, I think it would be interesting, you know, at a certain time if everyone just held their phone up, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, you measure whatever acoustic environment is going on at any particular time so that you develop uh, some sort of real-time map of what uh, this, what the audio acoustic environment is like in particular places, right? Uh, so acoustic weather or something, right? <laughs> so what, uh, what sound fields are like. So it'd be uh, sort of interesting. We have so much technology in our pocket 
at the moment. It would be nice to put that to some use. Uh, I should say that all of the, a little aside, all the microphones that are in these things are pre-polarized uh, Electret mics, right? Uh, which were invented by Jim West and his colleague uh, with a German name who I can never remember, but around 1960 at Bell Labs. Uh, and Jim, uh, Jim West is still with us. He's a re remarkable character. Um, but uh, I don't think they imagined in 1960 when they were developing these things that one day there would be literally billions of these things around the, around the world since uh, in this room, how many microphones do we have, right? You know, nowadays, uh, phones have several for doing, you know, the one that you use, but also for noise cancellation and other stuff. So anyway, and Jim, of course, received a dollar for his effort at <laughs> AT&T Bell Labs at that time. So uh, predictive, predictive tools. Uh, so I'm not uh, a real numerical guy, but um, uh, the things that I think would be useful um, so finite element methods seem to be uh, maybe more desirable at the moment than boundary element methods uh, because of the structure of the matrices that are involved, uh, which are arguably easier to solve. The traditional problem with finite element methods is that there hasn't been a convenient way to deal with radiation into infinite spaces, but that actually has been addressed in the last 10 years. So that is maybe not so much of an issue anymore. Uh, the thing that uh, we could still use more of is more complete uh, acoustical material models. Uh, we use Abacus a lot for various acoustical calculations, but the um, we, <laughs> we put a big effort into sort of fooling the software into doing what we want in terms of the material modeling, right? And so it would be a lot nicer if uh, sort of real acoustical models were built into the software rather than sort of having to trick it into doing things. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with statistical energy analysis, uh, which was in part uh, dreamt up by Dick Lyon uh, from MIT, and who we are proud to say is a native of Indiana, right? <laughs> comes from uh, Evansville, Southwest uh, Indiana. His <laughs> and I would say he's, he's not the most famous member of his family in Indiana because his daughter actually was lieutenant governor of the state at one stage, so Kathy uh, Davis was better known than her dad, Dick, but, um, uh, and statistical, uh, stat sorry, this is, uh, again, editorial comment, but statistical energy analysis has been very good uh, from the point of view of forcing people into um, uh, looking at structures in terms of substructures, connecting substructures together. Uh, dividing up uh, complicated machines, aircraft, cars, uh, and understanding the connections between one component and another. So I think the main, in my, in my this is a little bit of a radical view, but in my mind, the main benefit of statistical energy analysis has been forcing people to examine very closely the thing that they're trying to model. It has never been very successful in terms of quantitative accuracy. You know, forgive me, SEA people out there. I'm glad I'm thousands of miles away. Uh, so, uh, but um, I see, and I'm very much a deterministic guy. Uh, so I'm much uh, happy, much more happy with things like finite element methods and stuff. But. Uh, the thing that finite element methods are missing, which the st statistical energy analysis can give you, uh, is some idea of the uncertainty in the prediction. 
right? Because um, we've had now quite a number of demonstrations of the fact that, uh, so Professor Bernhard did a very famous experiment uh, around the time that you were there uh, measuring, uh, I don't know, a hundred trucks, Zuzu trucks coming off an assembly line, uh, doing transfer function measurements from suspension to interior and, and also acoustic uh, measurements. And of, and of course, uh, in the end, you find that no two of these devices, even if they're identical, are the same. Uh, and that there's a significant variability between quote unquote identical uh, mechanical objects depending on details of assembly. So a statistical energy analysis goes some way towards being able to quantify the uncertainty in the prediction, <coughs> whereas historically finite element methods have been, you know, you get one answer. Uh, but uh, these days, uh, there's a certain effort to introduce, uh, let's say, some randomness into some of the matrices that you're solving uh, to give you some clue as to what the standard deviation of the result would be given a certain number of trials and things like that. So I think uh, we will be heading in that direction with finite element methods, and I would see them ultimately competing with what you can do uh, with statistical energy analysis, particularly as machines, computers get faster and faster and faster and faster. And if someone does produce finally a quantum computer that someone can use, we will be uh, in a good position. Uh, the other uh, stuff that's uh, sort of interesting to me, finite difference time domain methods. Uh, so being able to do uh, time domain predictions of things. Uh, if you can do that fast enough, that is uh, sort of fits in naturally with a lot of data analysis, uh, signal modification, and playback things. Uh, but from a predictive point of view at the moment, uh, the boundary conditions are not so hot, uh, and poor elastic material models are absent. Uh, and so if those things, if somebody out here could address those, that, again, would be great. Uh, the other area that's getting pretty realistic is the uh, combination of computational fluid dynamics and computational aeroacoustics, CFD, CAA. Uh, so uh, people have been trying to do noise predictions based on uh, you know, direct numerical solutions of Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, for the last uh, 50 years, I think. Uh, and we are getting to the point where it now is uh, realistic. Uh, we've had a couple of comments, Professor Mahanti said the other day, about um, uh, one of the issues being that the acoustic radiation from turbulent flow, for example, is like five orders of magnitude lower in pressure or lower in energy than uh, the fluid flow, right? And so it becomes, um, let's say, a kind of signal-to-noise issue. Uh, the calculations have to be extremely accurate to allow a good prediction of these small quantities uh, that are buried inside the much higher energy flow stuff. But that is sort of finally coming under control, I think. And so we're getting to the point where we can uh, maybe do some fan noise predictions, but having said that, um, this, the state of the art, amazingly enough, uh, you would think that doing an 80 millimeter or 120 millimeter fan, like a computer fan, would be easy, right? But in fact, it's not, right? Uh, so the state of the art in, is you can maybe do the fundamental, a couple of harmonics, and that's about it. Uh, and people are almost getting to the point where they can do broadband noise. So we're getting to the point uh, where you can do fan noise predictions uh, with this, but it's taken, let's say, a startlingly long time, and it's still not easy. But anyway, if, if this can go a little bit further, it would be... <laughs> finally nice to be able to do optimal fan designs uh, that are optimally quiet with realistic inflow conditions rather than just smooth air in, because if you use fans in computers and servers and things, 
uh, inevitably the flow paths are just terrible, right? So the inflow conditions are a complete mess. Uh, the other uh, thing that we've done with computational fluid dynamics is, uh, let's say, micro-scale modeling of porous materials uh, so that you can work out things like the maybe the viscous characteristic length and the thermal characteristic length, uh, as well as tortuosity and other things by doing very fine-scale models of just a couple of pores, right? Uh, and so that is kind of uh, interesting, I think along with the idea of doing very thin absorbance uh, by uh, including internal degrees of freedom. Uh, as far as noise control methods goes, um, I, as I was suggesting this morning, sort of active noise control is back, I think. It went away for a while, but now it's back. Um, processing power and electronic devices are everywhere. <coughs> so the sort of preconditions for the success of active noise control applications exist now. Um, but again, I think there's kind of a target issue uh, in the sense that it would be nice to incorporate human perception issues uh, into uh, or human perception models. Uh, into the question of how you shape the fields to create pleasant environments. So not, not just something that's, again, quiet, quote unquote, but something that's desirable. Um, and these things, actually, I think um, an early argument was that they would replace a certain amount of sound absorbing uh, material. Uh, and I think, um, that is certainly true. If you can, if you can use an active noise control system successfully to deal with some low frequency uh, components, then I think you could get rid of significant amounts of weight of um, acoustic materials in vehicles. Certainly, so we'll see about that. Uh, advanced noise control materials, micro perfs. Uh, I'll say more about that later, but uh, very attractive functional attributes compared to fibrous uh, materials. Uh, carbon fiber composites, the kind of stuff that I talked about in the aircraft application, uh, sooner or later is going to be in cars, uh, and that's going to change the landscape from a noise control point of view. Uh, the conventional wisdom, as I say, is that uh, f with fibrous materials, you need a tenth of a wavelength thickness to absorb significant amounts of sound. Uh, and at low frequencies, of course, that's quite a bit of material. Uh, the holy grail here is um, uh, the idea of very thin absorbance, uh, which we are looking at where you try to engage, let's say, internal degrees of freedom that don't have anything to do with compression of fluid uh, near the surface. Um, uh, and I meant to add here uh, the idea maybe of using things like carbon nanotube loudspeakers uh, as active absorbers, so very thin uh, transducers. Uh, metamaterials are a hot subject at the moment, uh, so these sort of artificially designed internal resonance structures uh, that have nice sound transmission properties. Uh, our only claim uh, in that area is that no one has demonstrated a successful random incidence uh, case except us, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, but things, you can easily produce uh, stuff that works really well at one angle of incidence. Uh, it's much harder to do something at random angles of incidence, and that's what people need to concentrate on in that area. Uh, 3D, this is not news, but 3D printing is taking over the world, uh, and uh, s sooner or later, when the resolution gets good enough, maybe we'll be producing uh, 3D printing of uh, very fine scale acoustic materials, which would be nice. Uh, and by the same token, um, these days, of course, there's 
bulk manufacture of glass fiber, of the 3M stuff, Sensolate, of various other things. And what the customer gets to do is to select amongst a number of things that are closest to satisfying their application. Whereas in a, in a perfect world, it would be maybe the other way around, uh, where the uh, manufacturer produces something that's specifically useful for your application in terms of frequency ranges, fiber sizes, or whatever. And so I think uh, ultimately we should head towards this custom manufacturing of noise controlled materials rather than a bulk production and selection uh, thing. And multifunction acoustic materials, say, including damping as well as sound absorbing. Uh, and um, holographic reproduction and control and sound fields. Uh, this is again um, sort of happening at the moment, but um, it, the, uh, it's kind of the inverse of acoustic holography where you use an array of loudspeakers uh, to generate uh, prescribed sound fields so you can recreate uh, any kind of three-dimensional sound field that you want. Uh, things like this are being uh, developed uh, pretty aggressively in Korea at the moment. Uh, Samsung and other folks uh, are looking at using arrays of things to create uh, very focused uh, sound fields uh, for, for the purpose of communication. So when the, when the boss is sitting in the back seat, he can have a private communication with uh, with someone without the driver hearing what's going on, right? Uh, <coughs> so, and by the same token, if you can do uh, that sort of communication stuff, uh, then there is no reason that can't be combined with uh, some active control procedures to develop local uh, zones of quiet, right? Zone <laughs> zone of silence. Uh, so anyway, so that's my shopping list, as it were. That's my. If you want to give me a Christmas present, you can <laughs> give me one of one of one of these. I'd like you know the finite element with uncertainty quantification. That would be a good one. So if you want to do that, that would be fine. But um, anyway, let me finish in just. 10 minutes with a couple of other things. Um, so right at the moment, I'm particularly fond <laughs> of uh, microperforated materials. So I am very keen on these as a noise control uh, material. Uh, I think uh, you're aware that the, this is, of course, greatly magnified view and a cross-sectional view of a whole. Typically, these things have an open area of about 1%. Uh, the whole diameter is about a tenth of a millimeter. Uh, so the challenge uh, with these things has been making them, but we're sort of at the point where uh, you can reliably uh, create large-scale uh, things. This is uh, the thickness of this, uh, for example, is uh, about 300 microns. So that's like uh, a third of a millimeter or so. Uh, so they're fairly, they're fairly thin. Um, uh, and the holes uh, serve two purposes. They create a certain mass, right? The bulk of the amount of fluid oscillating in the hole. And because they're small, uh, there's viscous losses through here, and so there's energy dissipation that goes on. So if you combine this with an airspace behind, you create a resonant absorbing uh, system. If you use a couple of layers, you have a two degree of freedom system, so you can expand the bandwidth, and so on and so forth. And the reason one is sort of interested in this is that there's no fibers, so there's sort of no health issues in terms of uh, ingesting things. They can also be printed uh, so that it could look like a piece of artwork uh, on the wall, uh, which would be useful in, in restaurants and various other uh, noisy places. Um, and they're washable uh, if they were cheap enough 
uh, you could use these as uh, what what in the healthcare world is the wonderful euphemism, something that's consumable, right? These things used to be disposable, but now that apparently has a bad connotation, so it's consumables now. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are many terrible acoustic environments in hospitals. Uh, just being a patient is bad enough, but the operating rooms, for example, are very like reverberation rooms. Uh, with uh, very hard surfaces everywhere. <coughs> so a uh, sort of terrible acoustic environment for people to be working in for hours on end. Uh, so it would be nice to be able to come up with uh, noise control treatments for based on these kind of things that were either sterilizable or uh, you could simply replace, right? And these things are cheap enough that you could simply use them, throw them away, and replace and stuff like that. So that's uh, one thing. Um, uh, also, the idea uh, most uh, models for microperfs uh, assume that the material is rigid. Uh, and in fact, any time you make a microperf out of a polymer, of course, it begins to flex, right? And that's uh, something that can actually be taken advantage of. This normal incidence absorption curve for a rigid microperf material would look something like this. But if you give it, uh, and this has a certain size to it, but if you give it a certain amount of flexibility, uh, then you can produce these peaks uh, that have to do with energy dissipation due to flexing of the uh, vibrational flexing of the membrane. Uh, and so you can extend the bandwidth of the absorption peak uh, significantly by letting these things actually do some vibration. So that's one message out of that. Um, and uh, the other thing I mentioned in passing at one uh, stage, one of our friends here used to work for Autoneum, right, which was formerly Reader. And uh, Reader uh, came up with an interesting idea for uh, automotive noise control probably 15 years ago or more, uh, where the uh, the front of dash treatment, so if this is engine, this is an interior space in a car, uh, the original idea was that you would simply produce or use a relatively heavy barrier here on which you put the carpet to prevent sound transmission into the interior. And as I mentioned the other day, if, uh, if you let a certain amount of sound through but provide effective absorption looking back into the surface, that may be as good a solution and it may be significantly lighter and weight. So the idea of balancing uh, sound transmission performance and absorption performance is something that can still be exploited to give you uh, interesting results, I think, in a noise control setting. So that's uh, and maybe just to finish with a few minutes on metamaterials here. Uh, so uh, so. Meta, anyway, there are lots of different types of metamaterials involving all, all sorts of structures, uh, but the basic idea is that you, you create some sort of structure that has, um, that in the usual terminology, does not occur in nature, uh, and that you're designing to have some special properties. Uh, so this is a very simple example of that, where we've uh, taken, let's say, a a uh, sheet of material, a nice homogeneous panel, but then we've magically redistributed the mass in the panel uh, into uh, thin, relatively thin uh, plates and then thicker frames here that go around. 
So this structure here has the same mass as that one there, but now we have sort of thin sheets uh, held in this grid structure. And the point, I guess, is to look at the difference in the transmission loss uh, between the perfectly homogeneous sheet and the segmented um, uh, thing. I should say, sorry to give credit where credit is due, uh, this was work that Srinivas Varanasi did for his PhD uh, before uh, going off to work for Schlumberger in Houston and then more recently for Samulia uh, in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. They're the people behind Abacus. So he's, uh, he's, he's now the person we can call if we have Abacus problems. Uh, but uh, the idea of something like this is uh, the following. Uh, when I was talking about sound transmission of panels, we had a long discussion about infinite panels, but then I said that if a panel is finite, uh, it's held around the edges, and that actually at very low frequencies prevents it from moving back and forth, and so the transmission loss goes up to high values. Right, uh, so uh, it would be very nice to be able to achieve that kind of thing. And many of the publications related to uh, metamaterials show results that are sort of like this. Uh, but what they're not taking into account, shall we say, is the amount of mass that is required to in effect, constrain the material around its edges, right? Uh, so our, our job was to try to do that, to see if we could produce something that behaved like this, but we were not relying on some mysterious, infinitely strong uh, constraint at the edge. So, uh, uh, so that was the idea of simply redistributing the mass between uh, thin sheets, relatively uh, thick frames, uh, seeing if these thick frames would produce a transmission loss enhancement like that. Uh, and I will show you just um, uh, this result, which is a, a transmission loss prediction, but which uh, we can reproduce experimentally where this is transmission loss versus frequency. This line here is what you would expect from a homogeneous panel uh, having the mass per unit area of our redistributed panel. This factor mu uh, represents the amount of weight in the grid structure uh, compared to the weight in the little thin panels in between the grid. Uh, and if you achieve this mass ratio of about 100, uh, there's this pretty significant range of frequencies up to about here in for this particular geometry where you're sort of way above uh, the mass line here so that you can achieve a kind of significant enhancement of the transmission loss in a certain frequency range uh, if you do this kind of thing, but um, uh, of course this is a resonant sort of reactive effect, and so at higher frequencies the transmission loss goes down and would continue down into a dip before going back up again. So, um, and the other thing to bear in mind, this particular demonstration is for normal incidence. Uh, for random incidence, the effect is not nearly as strong uh, but if you control the sound field, if you can produce, combine the metamaterial barrier with something that causes sound to come into the panel at normal incidence, so like a grid or a, a layer of slow material, um, then you can begin to achieve something like this. So the metamaterials by themselves maybe are not so useful in random incidence transmission loss uh, uh, calculations, but they need to be combined with some other treatment to achieve the full potential. 
And so with that, I think I will quit with my editorializing. And uh, I've, it's great to have this opportunity to just rant, you know, <laughs> to <laughs> say, this is what I want. Give it to me uh, in my dreams. So, uh, but whatever. Anyway, thank you for listening. <laughs> Okay. There's nothing happening in the... We got a lot of help.